it's time to start uh, the next talk. Um, Tomasz uh, Nurkiewicz, correct? Very good. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about uh, new Java 8 API, completable future. Welcome. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Or, Strasvujcie. That's as far as my Russian goes. So, during this presentation, I'm going to show you not a language, not a library, just a single class. So, there's going to be a one hour talk about a single class originating in Java 8. So, this looks quite insane, but this class is so essential and it enables us to write programs in such a different way that I think it's worth it to actually understand how it works from, from top to bottom. So we're actually going to look just at completable future, Java Util Concurrent Completable Future, which is a subclass of, or actually an implementation of the future interface. It has a bunch of new methods which we're going to explore throughout this hour. There aren't going to be any slides during this talk, just IntelliJ and just code, so make sure you all see the code. If it's too small for you or anything else wrong with it, just let me know, I will adjust it. So once again, just code, Pay attention and let's go. So let me show you something. This is probably the simplest piece of code you can actually imagine. Looking at this one. So what it does is that it calls some method of some class and you pretty much have no idea what's happening underneath. So uh, what it does actually, I can show you the source code later on. It just goes to the internet, uh, fetches HTML page of Stack Overflow, of the main page of the Stack Overflow, and it just looks up the first question of, for a given tag. So if, I'm, if I run this code, it's not really relevant, but I, I guess it should be fun. Assuming I have internet, it should actually show me after about 500 or 600 seconds, this is the most recent Java question Stack Overflow. I guess you, you know the site. Uh, so if you now go to Stack Overflow, this should actually be on the top if you look at Java questions. But that's not the point. The point is, I'm running a method here, and just looking at its declaration, looking at its type, I have absolutely no idea what's, what is it doing underneath. Maybe it will return immediately because it's cached. Maybe it will take five minutes. Maybe it will break. I have absolutely no idea because the declaration simply says that it returns a string, which tells me nothing. And as a matter of fact, it actually goes to the internet, fetches some data, and if I run it again, you can actually see that it takes about a second to complete. So that's kind of how it works. However, there are many, in many ways in which this code is broken. And it's not broken because it doesn't work. It actually works. The problem with it is that imagine Stack Overflow website is down. I know it's kind of tragic, but it can be down from time to time. Imagine that we have a bug in our code, and for some HTML page, it just is unable to parse it, because there's some parsing involved. I have HTML, I have to extract some data from it, is the title of the question. So a couple of things can go wrong with this code, but probably the worst thing that can happen is actually if my code takes forever to run, because I might have a network issue, I might have an issue with DNS, whatever. So it would be really cool to actually have some way, have some idea to, to run it in background, have some timeout, and so on. So what we are normally doing in Java to make sure our code doesn't run forever is just we offload it to, to a separate thread. So here we have it. So what I'm doing right now, I have a different, uh, a different way of calling this method. So this one is blocking again. It's the exact same method as the one on the top. By the way, by the way these tests are really crappy. They don't test anything. It's just a convenient way of running snippets of code. So don't judge me. And this is pretty much just a callable. So I'm wrapping, uh, I'm wrapping a piece of code and I'm, uh, I'm wrapping it with a callable. And then I'm submitting it to a thread pool. So that's as simple as it can get. And what I get in return is a future. Now, how many of you know the class future, actually? Yeah, obviously. So uh, for those of you who do, who do not understand what happens here is that if a method returns a future, it pretty much means that it should be non-blocking. However, it doesn't return a result immediately. Instead, it gives you some sort of a handle handle of type string, which means that I'm promising you that you're going to get a string in the future, duh, uh, but it's not yet here. Maybe it will appear in, in 100 milliseconds, maybe it's already there, maybe it will appear under, after one hour. You don't really know. So that's what's going on. 
we have this uh, this particular piece of code here. However, there are many issues with it. So, for example, the only way to interact with a future is by calling get. Optionally, there's a second a second version that takes uh, time out. So I can say I'm I'm willing to wait up to one day. Okay, maybe too much. Up to one second for the result. If I don't get result within one second, then it will just time out and nothing really bad happens. Uh, but that's pretty much it, what you can do with old futures. So they, they, they don't really give you a lot, of, a lot of cool and fancy APIs. Let's say, for example, I want to wait for both of the futures. Well, that's kind of simple. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just having two futures, and this line and this line is non-blocking, remember. So it returns immediately, and we don't block the client thread. So what we can do is that we can simply say java.get, and later on we can say scala.get. That's about it. So first we block for the first future, and then we block for the second future. Of course, we waste yet another thread, because there's a thread running the Java future, there's a thread running the Scala future, and there's a client thread that we also has to block. And we don't really want to waste threads, because they occupy a lot of memory, and uh, there's a cost of context switching, and so on and so forth. But this is relatively simple. And at this point, I actually have Java result, and this one is a Scala result. What it does underneath doesn't really matter. This is not about semantics here. Uh, so I have two strings here. With blocking, that doesn't matter. But now I have a question to you. What if I want to wait for the first one? Not for both of them, but I want to wait for the first one. So I don't really care whether the Java future or the Scala future completes first. I just want to get the first one and forget about the second one. So do you have some idea? Excuse me? Yeah, there's something like a completion service, which is really executor completion service, which is relatively awkward to use, but it works. It just takes a bunch of futures. Uh, the simplest thing to do, which actually I saw uh, a few times, is to actually go in a loop. So you do something like uh, Java get, or let me just do it really quickly. So you do like Java get with a really tiny timeout, like one microsecond. And you do the same with Scala. And you do it in a loop which is like insane, because still, not only you're wasting a thread, but you're actually burning CPU. And of course, you do break when, when one of them actually finishes. This one, I think, either throws interrupted exception or returns null, it throws interrupted exception. So that's pretty terrible. And completion, the completable service actually tries to address this issue. Rather than having a future that the only thing, with, what it can do is just block on a future and do nothing, you have a completable future that allows you to register callbacks. It just sounds really terrible, because we, we hate callbacks, actually. But what it does is uh, it's pretty much the same principle as you have in, in JavaScript, where you have promises. Not callbacks, but promises. Well, it, any of you using uh, jQuery for Ajax? Yeah, so uh, many people don't realize it, but the, the, the Ajax method and all the others, get, post, and so on, actually return something. And the something that they return is a promise, which you can later on uh, process, so we can build a pipeline. We're, we're going to learn it in just a second. But also, uh, you have um, the exact same class in Guava for many years now. However, using it, it was called complete. It was called listenable future and settable future. However, using it was really cumbersome because you didn't have lambda expressions. So what I'm going to show you during this talk is how completable future can help you writing non-blocking reactive code. Uh, and more importantly, this code is not going to be ugly, and you're not going to end up with a callback hell. OK, so where does the completable future come from? By the way, I don't have any slides, and I also don't have any objections if you ask questions or if you don't understand something. So feel free to ask at any point in time. I guess there should be Mike here somewhere. Uh, so feel free to ask questions, and we can code something uh, in a while, or, or, or we can just try out stuff. Uh, so it's not like I'm showing you a static code all the time. OK, so this is how you create a completable future that is fixed, that has a constant value. So it doesn't make much sense to create a future like that, but it's sometimes, uh, sometimes reasonable, for example, for testing purposes or if you want to have some sort of placeholder. So you are creating a completable future which has a fixed value of 42, which means this future is a handle 
for some integer. However, if I call dot get, I'm pretty much guaranteed that it's not going to block. It will just return 42 immediately because this future is already completed. So uh, it's just a way of like changing from a type to a future of that type. Uh, we will see how, how come is it useful. However, there are more interesting ways of doing so. So let's say I have this method, most recent question about Java. This one that, this one that was blocking, blocking previously. So what I can do is that there is a simple factory method called supply async that takes a lambda expression. I think it's a supplier underneath, but doesn't really matter. So it takes a lambda expression of some type and it return, returns a future of that type. So you can actually guess that this method is, must return a string because you have a future of type string. Clear enough. Uh, so here's our future, and we can actually, uh, well, we can, we can block waiting for the result. Later on, you'll see the operators that are much more powerful. I hope you see that something is missing here. There's no timeout, and something even more important. There is no executor service, exactly. So what happens here is that I'm saying, OK, but timeouts is, is, a good, is a good answer as well. Who said about executor service? OK. These are for you guys. So we are missing an executor service here. because Basically, the completable future says, OK, I'm going to run this block of code for you in the background and don't care about the, 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 the underlying executor service. Actually, what happens is that there's this special thread pool somewhere in a fork join pool class called common pool. So I am in a fork join pool class. This, was, uh, this one was introduced in a previous version of Java. And it has this common pool, which is a static factory method returning some thread pool. We have no control over this thread pool. Yet, Java runs our block of code in it. So that's a rather a poor idea, especially since this thread pool is shared among all the applications, for example, deployed on, on an application server. So that's really bad. Uh, so luckily, there's an overloaded version, and this applies to many other, ver many other methods that we're going to see today. There's an overloaded version that looks exactly the same, but takes a second parameter, which is an executor service. And by the way, I already mentioned that completable future implements future, so uh, this one should still uh, compile. So completable future is just an implementation of future. Uh, however, if you want to be more, uh, if you want your API to be more robust, just return a completable future. And if someone doesn't understand the new API, he can just treat it as a, as a standard future. OK, everything clear so far? We will get back to the futures, but we will uh, learn a much more powerful way of handling futures without actually waiting. Sorry, for handling timeouts. For handling timeouts without actually waiting. OK, everything clear so far? Just nod your head. OK, cool. So what's so exciting about this new class? I haven't shown you that uh, yet. So a future, the standard future, has like five methods in total. That's the whole API it provides. That's why I said it's not really that robust and doesn't really provide you that many features. The completable future has a few other methods. So let us just quickly browse through them. So we have 45 minutes left. So I have like one minute per method. So time starts. OK. So we know how to create a completable future. You use supply async. That's like the canonical, idiomatic way of creating a future. So now what we can do with this one. I have a future of type document. Here's, a, here's another more low-level method that, uh, for a question, for, uh, for a Java tag, returns a document. So you can treat it as an XML document. It comes from some parsing library called JSOUP. It's not really important. But what I got in return is that since this method returns, come on, did it stuck? Since this method returns a document, uh, I actually get a future of type document. So what I can do with that future, assuming that my computer is not stuck, which is really awkward. Hello, hello. OK, so I'm going to talk for a little bit about the code. Oh, yeah, it got unblocked. It wasn't my fault. Just some garbage collection or something. So since this method returns a document, uh, I have a future of type document. And this one's pretty simple. What I can do with this one, of course, I can just go for dot get, which clearly returns a document. And then I, I just, I, I'm standing up right here. And I'm going away from the code because someone's taking pictures, so I want to look better. Uh, so this one returns a document, and then I can just call dot get. 
and then operate on this one as, as usual. However, .get, as you probably know, is blocking. So this is definitely not what we want to achieve. So what happens here, I can register a callback. And this will become painful in just a second, so don't go away yet. So what I'm doing here is that then accept, just as almost every other method in the new API, is non-blocking, which means this method is not going to wait. The execution of this method is not going to wait for the response for the document itself. If you don't see it, this is actually, let me add a type. Yeah, this is actually a document. So it doesn't matter that Java is a future of documents. The callback receives what's inside the future, which is a document. So that was fairly simple. I'm registering a callback here, and this callback will be invoked one day sometime in the future when the actual, uh, actual future completes. This sort of works, and we're going to use it from time to time. But there are better ways. Uh, so there's this method called then apply. What then apply is doing, and this is actually to prevent the callback hell. So what then apply is doing, this one, is that it takes a future, let me start from this, it takes a future of type document, and then it looks almost exactly as then accept. So it takes a document as, a, uh, as an argument and does something. So it looks like a callback, right? But what's really important is that this method returns a future of type element. Where do you think this element comes from? Where, wh what's the reason for this type here? Excuse me? Yes. OK, so the answer was that this expression has to be of type element. And the compiler infers the type and knows that the resulting, resulting future has to be a future of type element. But what does it tell us as well? I mean, if this expression returns a future, it means it's non-blocking as well. So we don't get a f an element in return. It's not a blocking, uh, a blocking call that waits for the response, does some transformation, and then returns it. Because if this was the case, we could just call java.get and then do all this, uh, what's here? Yeah, we can just go for this one, and this returns an element, and our lives would be much simpler. But this is not the case, because this transformation actually returns a future of type element, which means it's non-blocking. And this, of course, can go on and on. So I can go, I hope you're familiar with Java 8 by now. You should be. So what this one does is that it takes a future of type element, which is title element, this one, and applies on the contents of that future yet another transformation. This time, it takes an element and returns and uh, calls text methods. So I can actually go here. You see there is a text method on, on a class element. So going back here, this time we have a future of type string. I'm going really slowly here, but you'll see in just a second how powerful this transformation is. And what happens next is that we take a future of type string, we call string length on the contents of that future, and we get a future of type integer. Do you understand what happens here? This is really crucial because this will allow you to sink into the reactive world or completable future. Nodding your head. OK, but there's one question, yep? This is an excellent question, and we'll get back to it in just a second, OK? Uh, and it's actually not that straightforward, which I was painfully, which I painfully experienced. Okay, so there's like quite a lot of work. The question was, maybe you haven't heard it, which executor service actually executes all these transformations? And we'll, we will get back to it. So there's like a lot of code here and a lot of intermediate futures, but there's nothing preventing you from actually chaining all of this together. So what happens here right now is that we have Java, which is a future of type document, and then we say, then apply first transformation, then apply second transformation, and then apply third transformation. And what we get in return is integer, is a future of type integer. So if you forget about these, it actually looks as if you were calling normal Java methods on all of this. So you're just having an object, and you're applying one function, a second function, third function, and so on and so forth, on a simple Java value, even though this Java value is not yet here. It will be in the future. 
So what happens here is it, it's not really applying a function. It just registers our will that a function should be applied on the result one day. And by the way, all these methods are returning new future, which means that the actual future is left intact. So we can just stop chaining here. If I'm, oh. I can just extract this part, for example, and I can work with this future independently. So I can do some sort of like forking. So I have one, fu uh, there's one future, this one that originates the actual value, the one that represents computation. And I have two independent streams, one that applies one set of transformations and the second one that applies a different set of transformations, even though they all share the same underlying future. So, okay, let's get back to this one. Is this still understandable for you? So it's just like inlining methods altogether. So this was then apply, and this was this really simple, but really, really powerful. The whole purpose of all this juggling with code and juggling with callbacks is that you avoid blocking. So there's no blocking involved altogether until we actually hit this method, which calls dot get. But that's like a minor thing. Okay, now we're gonna get into some really meaty examples. So imagine you have a future. I'm just gonna throw it out for a little bit. We have a method called Java questions that returns a future of type document. So let me just go quickly through it. You see Java questions method returns a future of document. And what we wanna do then, having this document, you now understand that doc is actually of type document, so it contains the contents of the future. What we wanna do now is that we wanna call another method on top of that document. However, what happens is that this other method called the find most interesting question in a document. So you have an HTML document and you apply some artificial intelligence logic that can possibly take some time. You're applying a method that tries to find the most interesting question in that document. The problem is it returns a future, a future of question, because the logic is somewhat, uh, somewhat complex. So what do you think? What's gonna be the result type of this whole expression? Exactly, wow, you're awesome. So the reason why this one is the future of future of question, and I'm gonna make it clear for all of you, is that the compiler, or actually the JDK, is not intelligent enough to figure out that if you're returning something that is a future, you do not wanna double wrap it. So the, the contract of then apply is very simple. Whatever you return from the transformation gets packed back into the actual future. So that's why if you if I was returning if I were returning like 42, I would get a future of type string. However, since I'm returning something that has a type of future of question, this future of question is packed here. So I have a double wrapping. And this really becomes painful once you start working with it. Uh, because now if I'm gonna use a second then apply here, what I'm gonna get uh, as, a, as an argument is not a question. It's a question future because it's the contents of, uh, of the actual future. So this it becomes really, really painful. And there are a couple of ways to actually uh, work around it. And if you've been working with JavaScript, you know exactly how it works. So uh, you call a server. In a callback, you get a response from the server. And in that response, you are calling a server with a different request. And then you have a second callback nested in that first callback. And then you just have this pyramid of death of callbacks that are just nested and nested and nested. And this is what I managed to reproduce in Java as well. So you have Java questions, and then you hit then accept. Remember then accept takes a callback but doesn't really return anything. It just runs a piece of code when a future is done. So okay, I have a document. So Java questions returns a future of document. You all see the source code, right? You're not just listening to me. Cool. So, this one is a document, a real document because the future was, was completed at some point. So what I'm doing right now is that I'm calling, okay, so find me the most interesting question in that document. And this one returns me a future. So this has a type future. I can just extract it quickly for you, right? This is a future of question. So what I can do right now is that I can call then accept again, this time with a question. So now I have a nested callback that takes a result of that transformation and does something. So now having an interesting question, I can Google answer. And Googling an answer returns a future of type string, which is the answer 
to that question. But since it returns a future, I'm actually having yet another callback here, and it just keeps on and on. Look how many, how many callbacks do I have here nested? And at the very end, I actually have some logic. So the logic is actually hidden in this piece of code. So this is definitely not something I want to work with. Although it's possible to do this with, uh, it's possible to do this with completable future, don't do it. And this is just uh, like a counterexample and, and, and a bad practice. So what happens here is that if you have a transformation that returns a future, there's a different method, not then apply, but this one is actually called then compose. And let's just go quickly through it. The only difference between then apply and then compose is that then compose. Um, requires that whatever you return from the transformation is a future. So this is part of the API. And look, now it works. If it was then apply, like in previous question, uh, like in previous example, we would actually have this, remember? But we don't, because we use then compose. So what then compose does, the only difference between these two is that it requires a transformation, at this one, that returns a future, but it also makes sure that these futures don't nest with each other. So in a way, uh, they are running tasks one after another. And we can do it all over the place. So now we have a future of question. We don't have a future of future of question, we just have a future of question. Now I can do Google answer, which again was returning a future of string. However, since I'm not using then apply but then compose, I get a future of string. So we already have three background tasks running one after another. And in the very end, I'm actually getting a future of integer, and then I can do then accept, which is a callback, or I can do some other transformation. It doesn't matter. So is it clear in your head or no? OK, cool. So it seems really convoluted and quite verbose, and not because it's Java. It's because I want to teach you how, how it works. Uh, the, the actual implementation might look like this. And by the way, this code you see here is actually the exact same equivalent of this one, just without all the intermediate variables. So let's go back to it. You have Java questions. This one returns a future, then compose, then compose, then compose, then compose. That's it. And you might think that this is just a purely syntactic thing that we are just like avoiding callbacks or nesting and whatever. But think about it for a second. You have a future, and this future will return sometime in the future. Yeah. And then we have a second operation that requires the result of this first background operation. So we have one background operation that will eventually finish. We have a second operation that needs the result of the first one. And it's also a background operation that will eventually finish. So we have a bunch of tasks. We actually have, we have a graph of tasks depending on each other. But we don't want to block. If it was standard Java, we would just call first method, wait half a second, call second method, wait two seconds, call third method, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. But we would block the client thread. And this is something we really want to avoid. So what happens here is that we build an asynchronous pipeline of tasks where the asynchronous completion of one task actually starts another one. And this is done completely in, a, in a completely declarative way. You're just saying, OK, when this one is done, I want to run this task. And when the second task is done, I want to run the third one. And you have, absolute, uh, you have absolute control over the graph, but you don't have to do it declaratively. There are no callbacks. There is no, uh, there is no fishing around with threads. We'll see that in just a second. But this one is, uh, is really cool. And again, if we uh, get rid of these callbacks, it actually looks as if we were just calling methods. Even though all of these methods are asynchronous, all of these methods are returning futures, and everything happens in some asynchronous world, it still looks as valid Java. So it's not really, really that much bloated. OK, still clear so far? Yeah? That's also a very good question that deserves this, this coin, and we're going to talk about it later. But the exceptions propagate, but they don't propagate in the client thread because uh, the client thread is already gone because it's asynchronous. But we'll get back to it, OK? OK, so remember in the very beginning, I was actually showing you an example of, and I will remove this one for a second, I was actually showing you an example of two futures running side by side in parallel. 
or concurrently for that matter, and we wanted to do something when both of them are completed. So now I'm showing you how to do this in a non-blocking fashion. Let me just quickly remove this one. So I have a first feature, and I'm saying then combine, do not confuse it with then compose, then accept, and then apply. So I have then combine a second feature, and it takes a lambda expression. You already know this is all non-blocking, but you also can guess what these two parameters mean. So the first one is the result of the first future when it arrives, and the second one is the result of the second future when it arrives. So this one basically has to wait for both of them, but there's no blocking involved. It's just like a callback that we register somewhere that will eventually complete. And what's really interesting about this one, there's an expression here that returns an integer. So what do you think is the type of this whole thing? Hmm? A future, obviously. I think there was a question in the back. Yeah? No, it was just someone standing. I thought it's a hand raised. Okay. Uh, okay, so we have a future of type integer, and then I can simply go on and apply all these other transformations. So this is I. I can do whatever I want. So I can take two futures, combine them with each other when both of them are done. So imagine there are two tasks that are very easy to uh, parallelize because they don't depend on each other. What you do is that you just call these two methods, you have two futures, and then you just wait for both of them. So this can significantly improve uh, the throughput of your application uh, and uh, reduce the latency, uh, simply because it's easy to parallelize stuff. And of course, in the end, you can just call .get and it will still work. So we have a future of type integer, but there's even more interesting part there's the one that calls it. Just clean up quickly. Uh, so there's apply to either operator. And what this one does is that, again, it takes two futures, Java and Scala, and there's a lambda expression. But this one, it takes just one parameter. What do you think? Why? Hmm? Yeah, so many people answer that it's the first one that executed. So it doesn't matter whether the Java future or the Scala future executed or, or uh, was done first. It will just like invoke my Lambda and forget about the second one. So there's always a question, what happens with the second future, the one that was late? Nothing happens. And what really, what, what really bothers me and what's really sad is that JDK will not even try to interrupt the second future. It just keeps, go, uh, keeps going on and on. Uh, so that's pretty sad, but that's, that's how it was designed. Luckily, you can actually implement your custom future operators rather easily if you, if you, really, if you really hate this behavior. There's yet another thing with interrupts that uh, maybe there will be time to share with you. Uh, yeah, that's a valid point. So uh, the, 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 the comment was that the second future can be used in a different pipeline or in a different computation. So you cannot interrupt it because some other operation might be waiting for that future and uh, this one is not uh, interested in, uh, in our timeouts. So yeah, very good point. OK, so we have applied to either that returns uh, the first one to, to complete. And there are many, many use cases for that. Let's say you have two independent servers and you know that they both return the same result. So you're just, you're just calling both of them and waiting for the first one to return a result, and you don't really care about the second one. So this one can make your life a little bit easier. OK. So we can actually scale these operators into, uh, into more than two futures. So this time I have four of them, I think, yeah. So this time I have four futures, and I have an operator, a static this time, and that's, and that's, that's called all off, which takes a bunch of futures. And it returns, I wanted to delete this one, but maybe some of you didn't notice. What do you think will be the type of the future that takes four futures and waits for all of them to complete? Future of what? Yes, so you would expect a future, you know this is not the case, but you would expect something like a list of strings, right? Yeah, strings. The reason being is that since you have four strings, you would expect a, 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 a result to be a list of these four strings, where first element in the list represents the result of the first future. So that sounds reasonable, right? 
but it's not the case because it's, I don't know, Java. Uh, it can be a tuple as well. There are no tuples, but it can be a tuple of four elements. But what you get in return is void. And probably one of the reasons is that these futures don't have to have the same type. So you can technically uh, wait for two futures of type string, one future of type date, and so on and so forth. I don't know. But yeah, you get a future of type void, which means that if I do all completed then apply, what I get here is actually this guy, which is completely useless. So I know that the transformation was done, but I don't get the actual values. So this is pretty insane. You can somewhat work around it if you go for then run. Then run is similar to then accept. Uh, it's just a callback that it's invoked when the future is, is completed. Uh, but the difference is that if you call get here, you are guaranteed that this one is not going to block. Why? Because this callback, the whole thing, is executed when all of the futures are done. So you can safely call get. But this is just like a really uh, foolish workaround to, to some API deficiency. But that's not everything. I'm actually going to remove it immediately. So there's any off. Remember, previously there was all off here at the very at the very top, uh, but there's a second operator called any of. And what any of is doing, I guess you, you, you can guess, is that it takes a bunch of futures and it returns the result of the very first of them. And all the others are just discarded. So what do you think the type of this one should be? If we have a bunch of futures of type string, excuse me? Yes, yes and no. So. I would expect a future of type string. This would be reasonable because I have four futures of type I have four futures of type string and I'm waiting for the first one of them. So hey, I want a future of type string because I know all my futures are of type string. This time it's object because yeah, reasons. And if you actually go to if you actually go to a callback of then accept Remember, this one takes the result of the future as an argument. So it's an object. So it only compiles because I'm using the string here, but I cannot go for, for example, result length, which is a valid method on a string, because my result is not an, a string, it's an object. Technically, I know it's a string, but yeah, I still have to downcast it, which is pretty terrible. So it's not all that black and white with the new API. It's actually pretty terrible in some circumstances, yet it's still much better than what we, what we had, and we can just build some, uh, some layer on top of it. OK, let's just keep, put that one for later, and let me show you error handling. So there was already a question about errors. What happens when, uh, when an exception occurs? Remember future, even in Java 5, this is when it was introduced first, uh, futures can actually have two results. It can be a result of type t, because you have future of t, or it can be an exception. And this is fairly straightforward. If the block of code that was running in background threw an, sorry, threw an exception, this exception is later on a result of your future. Obviously, uh, it can't happen in the client thread. So here I have, uh, uh, here I have, here I'm invoking a method that asks for questions about PHP. And coincidentally, this one returns, or this one throws an exception. Uh, so if I go for then apply in this place, what do you think R is going to be? This is a tricky question. Yes, so this one goes for you. I think you were first. So there will be no R, because R is actually uh, a string, like this one. And there is no result, there is no string, because the execution never finished. There was no result of type string, there was an exception. So this one will actually never get called in this particular case. Not that it's non-blocking and it will run in, in, in the future. No, it's entirely, uh, it's going to be entirely skipped, because there's simply no value that you can invoke the lambda on. However, if you call the old-fashioned get method, it will actually throw not the, not the actual exception, but uh, the execution exception that wraps the underlying block of code exception. So this one throws. However, this one is absolutely oblivious to, to, whether the, uh, to, to, to the task that threw an exception. So that's pretty bad, because we want to go fully reactive, and we just 
entirely swallowed the exception. We entirely forgot about it. So there are, opera there are operators for that. The one of them, and again, the API is slightly ugly. Uh, there's a method on completable future that is called handle. And this one takes two parameters, either, either result or a throwable. So if the future returned, uh, if the future uh, completed with an exception, so it threw an exception, this parameter will be not null. And in this case, there is, a, uh, uh, there is some code handling this exception. If, however, throwable is null, it means that this value is supposed to be not null because this is the result of the actual task. So this is pretty terrible because we have an API that uh, has two parameters, but always just one is not null and the second one can be ignored but that's how they implemented it. What's interesting about this one is that, yet again, I'm deleting the, the re result type. I'm actually returning something here. So it's not that the only thing I can do here is logging an exception. I can actually return a value in case of an exception. Of course, you would normally do log error, blah, blah, blah. However, you can also return some sort of a fallback value. And this fallback will be propagated to the downstream operators as if the exception never happened. So this is a way not only for handling an exception, but also for recovering from exception. And if the exception didn't occur, we can run a normal transformation. So if this wasn't handle, but this was then apply, we would get just result, and we wouldn't get this part. So this is basically the same thing. However, since we also want to handle exceptions if they occurred upstream, so in one of the upper levels of the operators, we go for handle. There was a question, or did I? Uh, Excuse me? Yes, for both. Both for success and both for failure. So if the execution was successful, uh, this uh, this value will be the actual result. So it's, it, it covers both paths, the successful path and the, f and the error path. This one actually returns a future, so I forgot to ask you the question, but what's the result of this whole expression? What do you think? Uh, no. No. So sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay, but what's the... What's the result of this guy? Yeah. Yeah, I see you totally get what's going on here. So uh, it was actually called recovered in the first one, and it's called recovered because we recovered from the exception. We don't just uh, sit there and cry. We actually took the exception and returned it and, and translated it into some meaningful value. I think, but I'm not sure about it, I think if you just throw an exception from any operator, it will be treated as if the future threw that exception. So if any of the transformations throw an exception, or for example, take this exception and, and rethrow it, if you just do throw new runtime exception of throwable, uh, this will have the effect you're, you're looking for. But I'm not sure about it, so you just have to look it up. Okay. Uh, I don't think so, because this one takes a... It's a by function. No, it's not possible. This interface doesn't allow it. But who uses checked exceptions? <laughs> okay, and the last one, which is actually very similar to handle, uh, exceptionally does the same thing as handle, but it doesn't take the successful result as an argument. So this callback is executed in case of an exception happening upstream, so in one of the upper operators. And again, it translates the exception into something meaningful, let's say, so some error code, error code or whatever. Of course, you can do logging in this part, because once you return from this callback, uh, the exception is lost. So it's a, it's a good idea to do some logging here. Uh, and that's about it. So if there was no exception, then this line is simply not executed and we go further. Okay, everything clear with uh, futures or with error handling? Yep. Okay, so, 
So the question is what happens if I have a longer chain of futures like this one, then apply something, something, something. And the exception occurs somewhere in some of these lines, right? So remember, every then apply actually takes a, an argument, right? It can be an argument of different type. Every, uh, but e at every stage, then apply, or then compose for that matter, uh, assumes, I can actually go for then compose here, assumes that you get a successful result. So if an exception occurred at any point in this pipeline, all the subsequent operators are pretty much gone because you, you, there's no like value to invoke them. So the exception will propagate to the first handle or to the first exceptionally because uh, it, it can't do anything with it. And this is kind of similar to throwing an actual exception. As long as you don't have a try catch, the exception will just keep bubbling up up the stack until you get the actual exception. Okay. Okay, so let me just quickly go back to, for example, all and any. So the question was, what happens if one of these underlying futures return, or throw an exception, I should say. So this exception is propagated as well. So if, the, if it's, uh, sorry, I have to be more precise here. If it's all off, so if we're waiting for all futures, and one of them, even the last one, throws an exception, then this exception is propagated downstream because we don't have a single value, so we ha it has to be propagated, even though all the others succeeded. Yeah. The first exception wins, pretty much. Uh, I think it's lost. Maybe it's logged on system error or something. So, uh, yeah. But you can embed a built-in uh, handling right here. So if you want to make sure that every single feature is, uh, is logged, you can just go for this one and just include exceptionally on each one of them. You can do it declaratively somehow. And then you're going to get logging for all the f underlying features, and you can actually handle all of them. However, that's not the end of the story, because any of is interesting. If you're waiting for four different futures, and the third one failed, or the second one, then nothing really happens because the first one succeeded and it's the first one, the result of the first one that that's, gets propagated downstream. So we don't really care what happened to the third one, uh, second, third, fourth, and so on. The first one uh, succeeded, so we forget about everything. However, if the first one, uh, if the first one fails, the first one as in, in, in uh, the, the, the one that was the soonest to complete, so if the first one, I mean, for, let's say Scala was the, the, the fastest one. If Scala was the fastest one to complete, however it completed with an exception, then even though all the other futures completed successfully, the result of any of invocation will be an exception because the first future always wins, and it doesn't matter whether it wins with, uh, with a normal value or with an exception. This is the one that gets propagated. We can learn later how to alter this behavior by doing it more or less manually. I guess this answers the question. Sorry, I didn't catch that. I don't think I understand, but we can have a chat about it later, okay? Ah, no, no, there's no either, and it, it doesn't work this way with, uh, with futures. But you can build one yourself, and if we have time, we can do it, okay? Just on screen. So the question was, can you like get something like either in Haskell or in Scala, like having either this one or that one in a declarative manner? It's not possible, but it's fairly easy to, to implement. Okay, promises. This one is interesting. What's really cool about completable future is that you can actually create one from scratch. So have a look at this guy. What we saw previously is that we were either creating a completable future with some value, so you, we were doing completed future of 42, remember? And this one returns a future of integer that's already completed, and that's about it. We also saw that we can create a completable future using a factory method called supply async, which takes a block of code. 
This one you should remember as well. However, there's a third and really interesting uh, way of creating a future, which is pretty much just calling its constructor. And this one is interesting because it returns a future with no underlying computation. It's just a holder for some value, which we promise to deliver in, in the future, but there is no background thread, there is no thread pool, there is no nothing. It's just a container for a value. And we can actually set that value later from any other thread, but we'll get back to it later. So this one is called never. It's a factory method for futures that never complete. And this is like the simplest use case. So you can create a future that no matter how long you wait for it, it will never give you any value, simply because there is no logic for that. But there are more interesting ways of doing so. So let's say I want to create a future of type T that never completes normally. However, if you wait long enough, it will throw a timeout exception. So this is how it can be implemented. Let's just forget about these lines for a second. I'm creating a future and I'm returning it. I'm calling it a promise, but it doesn't really matter. So this is very simple to, similar to the, the method above called never. But what happens next is that I actually have a thread pool. This is a scheduled thread pool here. And I'm scheduling that after a given period of time, a configurable period of time, let's say one second. So I'm saying that after one second, I want to complete this completable future, explicitly complete the future from some other thread, and I want to complete it exceptionally with an exception. So what happens here is that if I actually call this timeout after method, what do I get? Duration of seconds two, let's say. What I get is a future that if I wait for that future long enough, actually two seconds, then it will return, or actually it will uh, result in a timeout exception. If I wait less than two seconds, then nothing happens. There is no value completed. So what do you think, how is this construct useful? Where you can use it? Excuse me? Hmm? Any of? Yeah, that's, that's a useful thing. Yeah, exactly. So what you can do is that I can technically have two futures, and there can be a, an arbitrary type here. So this one is called timeout, and this one is going to be called real logic, whatever that means. So this one, let's say, calls a database. And this one is just, just a fire hose which returns, uh, which throws an exception after two seconds. And then I can say future. Damn, future apply to either or any of, it's the same thing, uh, timeout. And here I get two results, so, or actually one result, which is a string, right? And this one is really interesting, so uh, please be careful. What happens here is that I have two futures. One is the, is the real logic, for example, calling a database, web service, whatever. And the second one is just purely a timeout, which will definitely fail after two seconds. So I guess you're, you can imagine already what happens here. If our real logic, this one, finishes within two seconds, we will actually get a, uh, a normal result. So if this one returns 42, or if this one returns hello, we will, re we will get hello here. However, if there was a timeout, so if the real logic took more than two seconds to complete, what's going to happen is that this callback will not going to be executed at all. Why? Because the first future to complete threw an exception. So this exception will actually be part of that future. It will be the result of that future. So what we can do later is we can go for handle or we can go for exceptionally. Uh, but there will be no result. There is just an, an, just an exception. So why go through all of these steps rather than just going for future get to... I mean, that's pretty much the same thing, right? We are... Hmm? Yes, exactly. So this one is actually blocking. So it returns a string, and it blocks up to two seconds. So either the real logic uh, completes within two seconds, or we get a timeout exception. However, if you go through all these steps and you actually 
combine these two futures together, you get a non-blocking behavior. So there are two futures. They, both are, they are both trying to complete as soon as possible. And if it was a timeout, then you get a timeout. If there was a real logic completing, then it's a real logic. So that's a damn useful thing to have. Is it clear? Yeah? Sorry? Yes, you have to keep an eye on that because the, the question was, is it a good practice on a busy production server? Because there are, are lots of uh, these callbacks that are probably never going to be executed. And the answer is uh, no, it's probably not a good practice, but it depends on how many scheduled items you actually have. But indeed, there is going to be a queue of pending, uh, pending, pending callbacks. And these callbacks are basically not doing anything because all of them will actually trigger this code. So every single callback we register will actually, uh, will actually execute complete exceptionally. However, we don't really care because the, time, the, 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 the first future already completed, so it doesn't really do anything. Uh, but still, there is like this huge queue of very short-lived, but still, uh, still tasks uh, to come. OK, what to show you next? I'm going to show you a simple refactoring, how you can go from blocking uh, API or callback-based API into completable future, unless there's something more interesting, but I don't think so. Okay, so here we have a method called load tag, or it's pretty much just asking for questions from Stack Overflow, you can see it here, and I'm using a, an asynchronous HTTP client. And the reason why it's asynchronous is that rather than returning a result, it asks you to provide async completion handler something. This is just some API. It's an example. We are not really studying this API itself. But what we want to do is see how we can uh, replace callback-based APIs with future-based APIs. So the first thing that you can see here is that it takes two parameters, on success and on error. So this, these are basically callbacks. This is the usage of this method. You call it load tag, and this one doesn't really return anything. It returns void. And it takes three parameters, the business parameter, let's call it like that, and two callbacks, what happens on the response and what happens on throwable. But instead, because we really love how the completable futures can compose with each other and so you don't have to pass callbacks around, you could just like pass a value, a future, uh, we want to refactor this method so that it uses futures. So the first thing is that we return a completable future of type string, right? Because the callback that we are supposed to provide, it takes a string. See here? It actually takes a response of type string and does something with it. So that's, that's what we are aiming for. Uh, however, we don't want to use callbacks. We want to use futures. So what I'm going to do is that I will simply return that future, which is here. I'm going to call it promise and put it in the very front. So we haven't broke anything yet. What happens next is that rather than calling these two callbacks, are you still following what I'm doing, by the way? OK, cool. So first, let's start from throwable. We have promise. What happens here? Great. If I can write complete exceptionally with an exception. And we don't really need this callback anymore, because this information is going to be conveyed in, uh, in the actual uh, future. Here, we have uncompleted. So you didn't learn that method yet. It's called complete, not complete exceptionally, but just complete. And this is a way of fulfilling or resolving a future from arbitrary thread uh, at any point in time. So we just created a future. This is going to be whatever it was, response, get response body. So this one is really interesting. We have a completable future, which we created from scratch. Remember, we just said new completable future here. So we created a future from scratch. There is no underlying thread pool, no underlying background task. It's just a container uh, which has no value, that, which has no task that's going to fulfill it. But what we are doing is that from arbitrary place in our application, we are just saying, OK, if someone listens to that future, please complete it with this value. And that's about it. So we no longer need this callback, this on success callback. So I'm getting away with it. 
And that's about it. So now we don't need these two parameters. So I'm gonna just remove them from here or I'm gonna use refactoring. I don't need this parameter. I don't need this parameter or I don't say delete. Yeah, delete anyway. Uh, so here what happens, here's what happens. We have a load tag method, which for some reason shines brightly, but doesn't really matter. I hope it's, it, it works. We have load tag method that looks much, much clearer right now. It just has a single business argument, a tag. But what we can do right now, remember it now returns a future of type string. So I can work with that future. I can, for example, say then accept, and this is my response. Or I can go for exceptionally, and this is my throwable, remember? Or I can actually do some composition. So I can do then compose, then combine, and all this stuff. And it's much easier because I don't have to decide right now what to do with the result. I can actually just return it here. And remember, it's non blocking. I can actually return this value here and let some other person decide what to do with it. So this allows me to control what to do when the task is done, not in the place where the task was executed, but in the place where someone is actually interested in it. So I think we're running out of time. So if you have some questions, you can catch me later. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. We didn't have any slides, and I hope you were uh, able to follow. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Спасибо.